Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Darcy Gretadaro. She's the director of the Center for Workplace Mental Health. She works with her team in developing high impact trainings, guides, resources, and case studies to support mentally healthy workplaces. Welcome to the show, Darcy. Thanks, Todd. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, so how'd you get involved in with the construction industry to, to begin with? Well, I, I took a look at the CDC data that is put out around uh, high incidence of suicide. And I saw that the construction industry had one of the highest. And mm -hmm. that led me to connect with uh, Cal Buyer, who I know has been a great leading voice in the construction industry, industry around mental health. And he and I just really hit it off and saw a huge opportunity to really address mental health, well-being, raising awareness, and addressing stigma within the industry. Yeah. Um, well, so May is National Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, so we really wanted to take time and kind of learn more and just bring awareness to this. Uh, and as you say, with the, the stigmatism around it, um, why do you think that there is such this stigmatism still that is around mental health and, and even burnout? Well, certainly stigma has remained a very pressing barrier to people getting the help they need when they have a mental health condition. And I think it largely arises from really outdated myths and stereotypes associated with mental health conditions, people seeing them as a sign of weakness or character flaw and not understanding. These are conditions like any other, like asthma or diabetes or other health issues they, we haven't necessarily seen a whole lot of people be very open about living with these conditions. That's slowly changing. Mm -hmm. But I think the stigma associated with kept people from talking openly about having mental health conditions. So it's kind of been a well-kept secret for many. But again, we are seeing a shift and it's a great um, moment to, especially with COVID and with the stress people are under, it's, it's been a great time for people to really begin to slowly open up, especially at higher levels mm -hmm. of organizations and really talk more openly about mental health issues. And that is going to help us eradicate stigma. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I was wondering too, you know, you brought up with COVID and everything has the, the last year with all the stressors and everybody kind of living through this same experience and, and having all the stressors put on their plate. Um, have you seen that be a, a pretty big tide change? Yes. So historically, it's been true that about 20% of U.S. adults have lived with mental health conditions. And the CDC has been, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has been tracking people experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression since March of 2020, and they've had a weekly pulse and are still running that survey, national survey. And what they're seeing mm -hmm. is a doubling and tripling of people experiencing anxiety, depression. And it does largely stem from high levels of stress. There's been so much uncertainty and disruption in people's lives that that has mm -hmm. really led to more and more people experiencing sleep disruption, high levels of stress are directly associated with depression and anxiety and substance use. So a lot of that stress that's coming from not knowing how long this pandemic will last, what the long-term impact will be on the economy and really trying to balance work and home life in new and different ways has led people to experience extremely high levels of stress. And that in turn has created higher incidence of anxiety, depression, and now we're concerned substance use. Right. That doesn't, not even taken into the uh, equation, all the isolation that people have been feeling over the, the last year as well, too. Yeah. So loneliness and isolation are major concerns. And there have been studies showing loneliness is at a much higher level as a result of the pandemic. So this is a very important issue when it comes to employers and really checking in with employees who may be living alone, but it's not just living alone. People can be very lonely, even in a household with others, especially those that are used to having the kind of social connection we had to give up. 
And it's true for people who are sitting, working remotely and all day kind of on these Zoom meetings. It, it can feel very lonely to, and isolating to not have that human to human contact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, so that brings up a, an interesting question there with the, the Zoom fatigue and everything, uh, which I, I <laughs> can sympathize with. That, that's a, a real thing. I, I, feel like I am way more wiped out after a day of, of Zoom meetings than I would have been with in-person meetings. Uh, what's the what's kind of the science behind that, of that the real Zoom fatigue feeling of it? That's a great question, and I'm not sure we truly know what the science is. This will be a period that we study, but certainly what we do know anecdotally is that people are experiencing that kind of COVID brain fog where they are just exhausted mentally from looking at the computer screen all day and being engaged in a way that doesn't involve in-person. There's real concern people may have to re kind of calibrate on their social skills because we're not seeing as many people you know, face to face in person. So there will be changes that happen when people return to a work arrangement that is on site. So that, that's a big uh -huh. question mark for many is what is that gonna look like? But there's no question there is brain fog associated with too much Zoom time. And I've been in meetings today in which organizations have said they are having Zoom free Fridays. They are cutting meetings short that used to be an hour to 45 minutes. So there's a recognition that we need to do more to kind of ease off the, the whole Zoom meeting all day long phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, well, good. <laughs> that's a good change. Uh, exactly. So bring it back to something that you said at the beginning uh, with that construction is one of the most at risk industries for depression, burnout, and, and even suicide. Well, what do you think are some of the, the factors that we need to be aware of that makes construction so at risk for this? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I believe part of it is that people are working very long hours. The stress is high. They may have uh, interactions with uh, leaders that are not always extremely positive. Um, I think also it's really important that people find purpose and meaning in their work mm -hmm. in terms of addressing burnout. And I think the more that those on site who are managers and leaders can help people feel purpose and meaning in their work, they can help to avoid some of that burnout. But certainly stress can come from not feeling like you have the skills needed to do the job, not getting the kind of feedback, positive feedback you should be. People, you know, really acknowledging your achievement and accomplishment, that can lead to burnout. Um, maybe having to change jobs frequently and move job sites can also lead to people feeling tremendous high levels of stress. And also we just need to support each other and it can really depend on whether that support exists on the work site or whether we're human beings at the end of the day. So it's really important that even in cultures that may have a tendency to be a bit more stoic, that we really recognize the importance of that human to human connection. And my sense is that's not always the case in construction. I think it is slowly changing, but that sort of tough person attitude of, you know, suck it up, get through it, don't be, you know, don't be a weakling. Those kinds of attitudes can really be pervasive and it discourages people from getting help when they need it and from really confiding in each other about some of the ways in which they're, they're challenged. And the ability to kind of openly share the challenges you're experiencing can really help you to overcome those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Uh -huh. With the, uh -huh. you know, the, the, mindset of the construction industry, I think you're for sure right, has, has long been that that stoic, uh, be tough, don't show any signs of, of, of weakness kind of attitude. Uh, I, I do see that changing as well, too. Uh, I, about a year ago, we did a, an episode all around the soft skills and, and why that's important and kind of break through. Um, and that's been one of our most popular episodes. And every time we, we really dive into the soft skills, people really are resonating with that and, and latching onto that, which is, it's cool to see that kind of turnaround coming in the industry. Yeah, I, I think that's really important because again, we are human beings and human beings need connection and you can mask so much for just so long. 
before it really begins to impact from a, the perspective of burnout, high stress that leads to depression and substance use. Eventually it catches up with you. So the opportunity to really support each other, talk more openly about the way people are feeling and the challenges they're facing, that's really important for well-being overall. Mm -hmm. So it's having a really kind of vibrant, healthy culture aspect of it is would that be one of the kind of the, the main ingredients then to kind of battle this phenomenon happening? It would be. I, I think making your mental health and well-being part of what's highly visible within organizations is also really important. So yeah. having leadership and whatever level you're at, you know, your leader above you and the leader above them really be open about the fact that we all have mental health and mental health exists along a continuum. So Hopefully we're all at a point where our mental health is strong and we're doing well and we stick with prevention, things like keeping our stress in check. A little bit of stress is good because it allows us to perform better. We're very attuned to the needs and we really are focusing on doing a good job. When stress becomes really problematic is when it becomes excessive and then it really impacts your health and well-being. So as a leader recognizing, like thinking objectively around how much stress are people under, what mechanisms and vehicles exist that allow people to communicate? Am I making that easy? So the other thing is when leaders show a little bit of vulnerability, so maybe they might say, hey, let's have a conversation about how each of us is coping with a really difficult time. I'm going to start that conversation. Here's how I'm coping. I've decided that I'm going to walk a mile every day after work, or I'm going to listen to music or just quiet my mind, turn off my devices. You know, the more a leader will share what they're doing, they're opening the door to other people sharing and setting an expectation they'll share. So that can mm -hmm. be a really helpful way for people to recognize, I need to take care of myself. And talking about things like sleep and, uh, you know, turning off, turning off work, not working, excessive numbers of hours, which can be difficult when you're on a construction site and you're on deadline, right? So maybe have mm -hmm. projects where you have a deadline and everyone's working toward it and then have a celebration. Recognize that people worked hard. When people feel recognized for their achievements and valued, it is really good for their mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that the personal touch that you added in there. And I really liked the uh, kind of almost reframing of the, the mental health as the continuum aspect of it. because. In, in my mind, I think it's so easy to think mental health as, oh, it's, it's somebody with, uh, you know, facing depression or, or burnout, and you're, you're facing that kind of, uh -huh, that one side of the continuum there. But really, everybody has mental health. You, you, I, I love that. Uh, you're somewhere on this path, and, and everybody's struggling with stress and, uh, you know, craziness going on around them, and it's how we're, we're coping and dealing with that. So I think opening that conversation up is, I, I love that. That's a good takeaway. Yeah, and I think we forget that we all have mental health and that we have to take care of our mental health and that yeah. it is on a continuum. And this is a historic time. We've never, none of us have ever been through anything like this. So clearly we are stressing and straining our mental health. And so we are likely moving on that continuum a little bit more into the not quite as mentally healthy. And we constantly have to be thinking about how do we keep ourselves kind of upstream on the prevention side with strategies that really help us stay mentally well, because we don't wanna to move to the other extreme, which is now we have a diagnosable condition. And like mm -hmm. any health condition, diagnosing and treating mental health conditions early leads to the best result. Yeah, so let's back up for a minute and really define what burnout is for people. Great question, because burnout is a major issue of concern. So much so that the World Health Organization developed a definition for it and released that in May of 2019 to frankly great fanfare. And the reason they did is because worldwide burnout is really a major concern. So I wanna share their definition because I think it's really uh, fitting to many of the experiences that people are having in the workplace. And by the way, they targeted this specifically to the occupational space. And that is hmm. feelings of energy depletion or just utter exhaustion. So emotional exhaustion, that's the first element of it. 
The second is mm-hmm. increased mental distancing or feeling really negative or cynical about one's job. So just feeling like, oh, this is just not where I want to be. This is just not what I want to be doing. And then the third element of it is really reduced effectiveness in your job. So you're just not performing as well. And those are all the elements of burnout that have really now been accepted as the a formal definition for burnout. And there are, there are things that both individuals and organizations can do. And I think this is an important aspect because part of the reason people are burned out is not just their responsibility to, to change and address, but it's also the responsibility of organizations. So from a, mm. an individual perspective, Obviously, we all need to learn how to manage stress. But from the organizational perspective, if you're piling stress on, if you're providing unreasonable deadlines and piling on work that can't be achieved realistically in that time period, then you're going to have people burned out. So the organization has responsibility. Then we really need to practice self-care. So this is where we keep ourselves on that healthy side of the mental health continuum, right? So Mm. exercise, sleep, uh, interaction with family, all of those things that help with self-care is really important. Also, practicing positive thinking. This gets to the idea that like a person is cynical, they're super negative about their job. We all need to kind of reorient ourselves to find the good when we can. Mm. Also learning to say no. Now, this is where the organization comes into play, right? Because you can't always say no to things that the higher ups are requiring of you. So the organization has to really be thinking about how do we help people succeed? How do we recognize that there have to be times when people will say no and can say no? Mm -hmm. And then also celebrating small accomplishments on the individual side. And the organization also has a responsibility for celebrating accomplishments and achievements that people have, um, have met. And then finally, whenever work produces positive results, taking the time to really single out those who were part of the process of achieving that positive result. So all of those things go toward reducing and eliminating burnout, but it is the responsibility of both individuals and organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are the kind of levels of of burnout? And my thinking here is, uh, I think we all go through phases of, of that definition, <laughs> you know, of, of some days just being done and, and fried and totally exhausted. And then you wake up the next day and you're good to go as a, maybe a, a bad day, but then sometimes those phases can last a really long time. So can you go kind of in and out of burnout or are there, there are certain levels or, or stages and progressions where it gets more intense and there's a point of no return, so to speak, that once you, you kind of hit this point, then you're just kind of, you're kind of stuck in in burnout until something really drastic happens. Does that make sense? Yes. And you just did a great description of what it is, which is, it's also on a continuum, right? So I may have, I may be burned out today and just feel like I cannot do this anymore. And I, the work is really getting to me and everyone has those days, no question about it. Mm -hmm. And that is not, the kind of burnout that typically leads to high levels of stress that leads to mental health and physical health issues, right? I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. but as you move along that continuum, so that now I'm feeling burned out three days a week, it's starting to impact other areas of my life. I'm having stomach aches, Mm -hmm. I'm having migraine headaches, I don't feel well, I don't wanna go to work, I'm not interacting well with my family, it's, getting to be a bigger obstacle in my life, as you march more and more toward that, it's time to really take stock and say, and the other thing is try taking a break, right? Okay, I'm burned out. I need to take a day. Okay, I'm, I'm just really mm-hmm. going to take a day. Okay, now I'm really burned out. I need to take a week. I need to take a week off. None of mm-hmm. that is helping. And I'm starting to use substances. And that is when you really need to start thinking about getting help. And you need to, mm-hmm. to figure out, you know, before you get to that very deep end, before you feel physically ill and you feel mentally ill, then you've reached the point where it's much harder to address it. You may have to take a whole lot of time off and you don't want to have to do that. So it is that continuum and you yourself need to know, and everyone's different, 
some people can handle a ton of burnout and really you know, get back to a point where they're at a healthier space. But other people, it takes very little to get burned out to an extent. It's really hurting their health. So you just have to know yourself. Mm -hmm. There's no silver bullet around uh, 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 and sort of how, how we all should measure our burnout rates. Mm -hmm. well, what are some um, signs that as a, a manager, you should be aware of and kind of on the, the lookout for of like, oh, this person's starting to kind of creep in that direction and I need to pull back from them or something? Yeah, I think that that is a great question because it's also not easy, but look for changes. You know, look for changes in the way someone's behaving. They're not as engaged. They're maybe they are flying off the handle more easily. They're angry. They are uh, showing up late. They're just not producing from a uh, productivity perspective as well as they usually do. The, the operative word is change. And when you start to see those changes, you know that it's time to have a conversation because that could be any number of things. And, and also really look critically at what is our work situation look like right now? Are we under huge deadlines? Am I asking a lot of my people is this gonna last a long time? Am I communicating well with them around where they're at emotionally and health, you know, as far as their health is concerned? So it's, um, you know, it, it is the changes you see in behavior, mood, thinking, performance, those are key indicators. Mm -hmm. well, how, how do you go about starting that conversation or around mental health or, or burnout with people in the, the workplace, especially with, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, that the construction industry is historically more stoic and not into the uh, the warm and fuzzies and, and, and kind of those feelings and that may not come naturally to a lot of people in construction. Uh, how did how would you encourage them to kind of start that? I think that is the biggest challenge because we've been doing this training notice talk act at work, and what we're hearing a lot of is that people know how to see the changes. The hardest part mm -hmm. is the conversation, the talk part. So what I would say mm -hmm. is if you're worried about someone else, it is important to start a conversation. So to use the talk approach, the best way to do it is to really, first of all, think through what you want to say to the other person. So you're sort of feeling a little bit more comfortable. Make sure you're leading from a place of care and concern. Use I statements. Things like, Darcy, I'm seeing that you are, you don't seem like yourself. You're showing up late. You're not as engaged in the work as you've been. And I'm concerned about you. What's going on? Use an open-ended question, right? Mm -hmm. So that you are you don't say, are you okay? And the person says, yes, go away. Because now you've closed the conversation down. So use it. Mm -hmm. And also choose a quiet, private place to have that kind of conversation. You don't have to use the mental health language. What you can do is just use I statements because then you don't put the person on the defensive. Like you are not showing up on time. You are, instead you're saying, I'm seeing that you're not showing up on time. I'm seeing you not performing at a level you usually perform at. And I'm worried about you. So I wanna just get a sense of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then listen, wait, and let the other person speak. And it's very possible the other person may say, I'm fine, and give you the go away message. That's okay. Keep your eye on it and see how it's going. If you continue to be concerned, try again. You can say, hey, I'm still concerned about you. Sometimes it takes a few times. And as long as you're doing it from a place of empathy and compassion, and you're truly feeling like, and you're saying, look, I care about you as a coworker, as a person, as a friend, just keep at it and keep trying. Eventually the person will likely open up. I will tell you mm -hmm. that we had a, a virtual town hall last week called Changing the Conversation. And we had people that all have diagnoses on talking of, and, at high professional levels. And one of our guests was the safety lead at Microsoft. And he said, I started to be very angry at work. And I started just sh you know, showing my anger toward others. And he said, my manager took me aside and said, here's what I'm seeing and I'm concerned about you. And I really think you need to reach out to the EAP. And he said, it's the best thing I ever did. 
I reached out to the EAP. They connected me with counseling. And he said, I, I got treatment. I have three diagnoses and he's performing exceptionally well now. So, you know, acting out in anger can be a sign, but starting that conversation is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I imagine too, it, it helps uh, if you have already kind of established that rapport as well too. And the, you're, as a manager, your employees, they already know that you kind of care and that you're in their corner and that you're with them and that you're kind of in this journey together that it makes that conversation go easier uh, when you are kind of daily checking in on them before you see signs of them as well too, instead of just coming up out of the blue. That is so spot on. That level of trust is key because let's say you have a contentious relationship with a, with a manager or the manager hasn't necessarily been supportive with you in the past. That is probably mm -hmm. the last person in the world you want to show any sign of vulnerability with, right? I mean, who would want mm -hmm. to ever do that? You would be worried there'd be negative consequences because right. you'd feel like that person wants to get rid of me anyway. So that is very important. That word trust is everything. So Darcy, how would you define resiliency and what would you, you want to tell the world about it? Great question, because resiliency is really important. Resili I heard someone describe it as resiliency is bending but not breaking. So it's a great analogy because it is this idea of our ability to respond to challenges that come our way and to really, in responding, to bounce back from them. And I think we all face challenges, and especially I would think in, on construction projects that people face tremendous challenges. And it's really important to understand mm -hmm. resiliency from an individual, again, just like burnout from an individual and an organizational perspective. So from an individual perspective, it's really about uh, tapping into social support. So we all need to have social support. So if you don't have social supports, you really need to make sure you can build those because those make a big difference in people's lives. Also, mm -hmm. just like burnout, it's keeping a positive attitude so that you are able to adapt. So if you're constantly thinking negative thoughts, then it kind of beats you down and your ability to bend is more difficult, right? So you got to kind of keep that mm -hmm. positive attitude. That's really Im important. Also incorporating either spirituality or religion or meditation or some way of sort of disconnecting from all the stress and challenges of life to sort of think and use your mind in ways that help to relax it and help your mind to, to be strong. And then mm -hmm. also um, thinking about how in your life you've responded to big challenges and what in the past and what skills you brought to bear in doing so, because those mm -hmm. are the skills you wanna really hone in on and really sharpen. And then from an organizational yeah. perspective, you know, the organization, can really help to foster that network of connections. So the social support I talked about, create you know, mentoring opportunities, especially on a construction job. You might have someone brand new or someone struggling a little, you know, partner them with a mentor to help them through even just a really, a little bit of a rough patch. Also, you know, this is where stress matters. So making sure people's stress is not out of control. So you know, evaluate objectively and let people make some decisions on their own. So nobody wants to feel like they have no control over what's going on. So it's really important to at least try to give people some decision-making and then again, really rewarding them for the good work they do. So they feel a sense of meaning and purpose in their work. So mm -hmm. there's organizational resiliency and individual resiliency. And what we want is to get people to a point where they can bend and not break. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that mantra. Then don't break. Yeah, that's it. Well, how do people find help uh, when, you know, how, how do they know where to, to go outside the manager, I guess, um, and, and be able to, to get the help that they, they need? Yeah, a lot of people get help initially through the EAP. And I know the national numbers on EAP use are, is still very low. So it's unfortunately not used by enough people, but it is the employee assistance program that many people have 
is an option to talk with a counselor to have sort of an initial sense of where things are at and they can connect you and make a referral to a mental health professional. Also mm. talking with, if you're comfortable doing so, not everyone is, but HR often knows about the benefits that are available through the organization. I mean, many people are concerned that by doing so and talking with HR, you may put your position in jeopardy. And I understand mm. that. But I think we've gotten to a point where many HR professionals recognize that the best thing an employee can do is get help if they have a mental health issue. That it doesn't mean they can't perform their jobs. It just means they may need to step back a little and get a handle on things before they can um, you know, move forward and perform at their, at their best. In, at their best. And I think too, mm -hmm. many employees have health benefit plans. Most health benefit plans have mental health resources. There are also community organizations in most communities around the country. So NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, is an organization where you can find out a lot about resources that are available in the community. There's also Mental Health America, which is a community level organization. So, I mean, we work at the 30,000 foot level, they work on the ground and they have offices across the country and they can be a great resource, especially if it's not per se you, but maybe it's a child or an adolescent in your home or a, another family member. They can be very helpful there. Nice, good to know. Uh, so it seems that there's kind of this thought process that people, they can't slow down. They can't admit to burnout or, or mental health because there's, there's just so much pressure to stay productive. I think, especially in construction, that productivity is you know, a big driver. How would you kind of argue back that, that help is getting help is actually probably the most important productive thing that somebody can do? Well, the studies are really clear that when you have a condition like depression, it really impacts your productivity. So it, it, it impacts your productivity in missing work days, but also in what we call presenteeism, being present but not fully engaged. So people may feel like, well, I can't take time away. I'm on this schedule. I've got to get this done. We have a deadline on this build. I, I just can't take time away. But in reality, if they're there and they're struggling with depression, anxiety, trauma, they are not, they may feel like they are, but they are not bringing their full selves to work. So mm -hmm. they just need to be aware that getting help and getting help doesn't mean you have to leave the workforce and you have to take, you know, time away from the workforce. It often means you get, you take time out for therapy. And now with this virtual world we're living in, it's easy to connect with therapy in the evening, on the weekends, therapists are working all kinds of hours. Also your primary mm -hmm. care provider can provide you with uh, treatment and help. So you don't have to go to a behavioral health specialist, but, but the reality is you may feel like you're being as productive as you would be not getting the treatment, but in reality, you're not. So, so you might as well take the time to get the help you need so you can perform at an even higher level. And I think that's mm -hmm. where organizations that really focus on making it psychologically safe for people to get the help they need are seeing high returns because they recognize that when people get help, they're more productive and the bottom line improves. So Darcy, how would you encourage the industry to bring more attention to mental health in construction with outreach and support? Yeah, I think, you know, I know there've been toolbox talks, which are really important. We are in the midst, we just did, I think I may have mentioned to you, we did a national survey of the construction industry mm -hmm. and we will be putting out the results in the next month that shows mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity to do more. So if there's an intranet, putting information about mental health on the intranet, if organizations are communicating via newsletters or online, other online uh, communication methods, send just little like, hey, did you know that the warning signs of depression are um, the following? And by the way, here's how you can connect with care if you need help maybe putting out warning signs, putting out statistics, letting people know that this is an organization that values your mental health and well-being, and we are going to support you getting help when you need it because we recognize that's how we produce 
the best uh, products. That's how we, we produce the best uh, end result in our, the building and construction industry. I am really impressed that I think there's a growing movement within the industry to do more in raising awareness. You can bring in speakers, you can bring in people with lived experience to talk about how they've um, overcome conditions through treatment and through support from uh, clinicians and others. So I think getting, opening up this whole array of things, it's not a check the box thing. It's not like do one toolbox talk and okay, we're good. It is a steady drip of information and initiatives that show your overall commitment. Nice, yeah, I like that. Uh, well, how do people get a hold of you and, and find out more information? Sure, uh, we actually, I would encourage people to go to our website, workplacementalhealth.org. It's easy to remember. Again, workplacementalhealth.org. And uh, they can certainly email me. My email address is dgrutadaro, G-R-U-T-T-A-D-A-R-O, at psychpsych.org. And again, as I mentioned, we will be putting out a, a survey report on mental health within the construction industry. And we will be building tools that people identified as important to them based on the survey in the future. So please do visit us and we hopefully we'll be putting lots more high impact tools out on the, for the construction industry. Awesome, sounds good. And we can link over to that website as well too in the, the show notes for people. Great. Uh, so last question that I, I ask all my guests, uh, this podcast is, we, we really like to put the, the spotlight on construction innovation. So uh, with that in mind, what does innovation mean to you? So I would say innovation means continually finding ways to do what we do better and to measure our results in a way that shows what we've done works. Nice. I like it. Well, Darcy, thanks so much for, for coming on and, and talking about this really important topic. I, I really appreciated all your, your insights. Thanks, Todd. And you're doing great work to raise awareness. So I really appreciate the great work you do.